We arrived here in 1950, and uh, I came with my mother, my stepfather, and my brother Jaime, who was a tiny little boy at that time. He was two, one. He was one year old when we came here. And um, we came to open the Instituto Allende. My stepfather had a beautiful idea of uh, renovating the old building of the Condes de la Canal. And uh, he renovated it. And his idea was to open an art school for Mexicans. Was that a convent before? No, it was the home of the Condes de la Canal. It was renovated. The, the fountain that's in the middle of the Instituto was down on the floor, but it was still intact, so they were able to, to put it back together again, and then they put the rooms and classrooms and so forth back together. And the idea, as I said, was to make a, a, an art school for Mexicans so that Mexicans could understand art, could participate in making art works of art. It didn't turn out that way because we had a great influx of foreigners that came into the school. We were uh, validated by the University of Guanajuato, so we had a lot of credit students that would come in. In the summertime, we had a lot of teachers that would come in for, for credits. And uh, it turned out to be completely different from what my family had, had thought of doing. Oh, Sterling. There's some good stories about Sterling. Sterling came in early on into the Instituto. My stepfather never worked at the Instituto. He obtained the money to purchase and open and renovate the Instituto. But my mother was the heart of the Instituto, along with Sterling. And uh, our beautiful Sterling would bring people. There was a great story about Sterling. Sterling went to Nigeria, and he was invited to speak on the radio. So he invited people to come to the Instituto Allende to study Spanish, to study art, etc. And all of a sudden, we were invaded by about 20, 25 Nigerians who had no money because Nigeria at that time had coups all the time and, and they would close the country and no money could go out. And we had some very good students. We had a beautiful, gorgeous Nigerian by the name of Peter and his beautiful wife. And there was Stanley who, who was a dancer and would go to the ring and, and dance there. And uh, many of them got degrees, finally. But we told Sterling, next time you travel, no radio, please. <laughs> that must have been 60, maybe 68. I don't remember the year, but it was in the 60s. One of the stories. I was 14 when I came to San Miguel, and I wasn't very happy to be here because I was coming from Mexico City, and I had a boyfriend in Mexico City. But uh, pretty soon I made friends. There was a very small foreign community, very small foreign community. I became part of the Mexican community, and uh, I was studying in the States at that time. So I would come and go. I'd be here in the summer. There was one summer when I was 15. I had a, a bullfighter was a one of my boyfriends, and he was, I was 15 and he was 30, so my family didn't allow me to see him, and I would sneak out to see him, and I'd go to mass and see him at mass. They, they, those things don't happen anymore. No, I couldn't understand why my family wouldn't let me see him. He was just 15 years older than I, and then I married my husband, who was 14 years older than I, but by then I was 20. I came to live here in 1952 and um, worked at the Instituto Hotel 
and then later worked at the Instituto itself. And uh, I met my husband through a girlfriend of his, an American girl. <laughs> and we were married in 1955. And we have, we had seven children, and now I have nine grandchildren. My husband was from San Miguel. He was born on Recreo Street, just down the street, where we lived for many, many years. There's also a story on that. My husband inherited this house from a family. There was a family called Espinosa who lived here. And there were several brothers and sisters who fought among themselves, so they divided the house in two and half of them lived on this side and half of them lived on the other side. And uh, they had beautiful antiques. I've seen it, some of them in some Mexican homes here. And they ran out of money. They had no more money, so they started selling all their things. And uh, <clears throat> my husband used to say that he, when he was a child and he would pass by this house on his way to school, Oh, he said, I would wish I could have this house, but like a dream, you know. And at the last, there were two Espinosa ladies left. One of them, her name was Emerenciana. They almost lost their house because they had not paid taxes in a long time. And we were in Guanajuato at that time. My husband was a state representative, and we were living in Guanajuato. He was also the head of the public health service in the state. And they saw him, and he fixed it so they did not lose their home. And they did not have to pay all the back taxes that they owed because they didn't have the money to do it. And my husband's nursemaid was of the same age as the Espinosa women who were left. And she told my husband, you know, they have no money. They have no money to eat. They have nothing. And one day, Emir and Siena called him over and told him, said, you know, I have many, many, many nieces, nephews, grandnieces, grandnephews. Nobody ever comes to see us. I want to leave my house to you. So it happened. It was put in his name. She ceded her house to him. And when... The last, when Emerenciana died, who was the last one, we had problems with all the grandnieces and nephews who then did turn up, of course. But my husband loved this house very much. This house is 1542. The door is 1791. And the door is made of one piece. It has 41 rooms in all. 41? Yeah. But I rented out, as you know, I have the Correo restaurant rented sí. out. And this part here where now the princesa used to be, sí. which was the place to go at night. And now the Companio has everything except for a little piece there. It's, it's a beautiful home. It's a beautiful home. I should sell this house because it's too big for me and I can't keep up with the repairs. But my husband loved it so much, and I do too, so my kids can do whatever they want. I have a gringo son that lives in Dallas, Texas, my eldest son. I have a daughter that lives in Celaya. I have my doctor's son that lives in Querétaro, and all the rest live here in San Miguel. I'm Mexican, but I'm not a true, true Mexican because I had so much influence from American, my American side. My father was British, so I wasn't completely Mexican ever. And I was able to see with the Mexicans what they felt about the foreigners and with the foreigners what they felt about the Mexicans. When we first arrived here, the foreign community was very small, but most of it was integrated with the Mexican community. 
was very different. You'd go to a cocktail party and you'd meet Mexicans and Americans, Canadians. Always, there were always a lot of Canadians in San Miguel, beginning with Leonard Brooks and Riva, you know? And uh, I could see and I could understand why the Mexicans, especially the Mexicans who did not have that much money, were a little bit resentful of the foreign community because it seemed like they had everything. It wasn't necessarily true, but to them it seemed they had everything. And the foreign community, as I said before, at first formed a part with the Mexicans, but then as the community grew, many people that came were not interested in, in the Mexican community. And I remember one time at the Volkswagen agency, I was there for something, and there was a man there screaming and yelling, and, they, and he was saying, in America, I would do this and that and the other. And I just couldn't keep quiet. I went over and I said, why don't you go back to America where you can get everything you need and, and don't be bothered with this Mexican town. But I don't know if that has changed that much because, you know, I work as a translator. So I'm in a lot of closings, and while we're waiting for the papers to be ready, um, people are chatting and talking and saying, no, of course we're in Mexico. In Mexico, everything is different. In Mexico, everything is slower. In Mexico, this, in Mexico, that. But those are the people who have come in the last few years who have purchased houses or built homes on the outskirts in those developments that have surged in San Miguel. And they don't care about the Mexican community. They could be anywhere, no? But there are still many, many wonderful foreigners who help. We would not have a, a library if it were not for the um, foreign community. The, the library, I'm sure you know that. I lived on Recreo Street, just down the street, and there was a woman by the name of Helen Whale who lived right around the corner. And she began the biblioteca in her living room, uh, obtaining books for the children. Then it grew to what it is now, but it has been supported always by the foreign community. And there's so many things we can talk about. Ojalá ni I mean just so much that would not exist if it were not for the foreign community, who has always opened their hearts and, and their pocketbooks for things that help the poorer Mexicans. So you do see a positive influence from the I see positive and I see negative. I see a little bit of everything, no? You see a lot, yes. And And the Mexicans, depending on the social status, they have had work thanks to the foreign community. They've had constructions, they've been able to work in construction and so forth, maids, etc., etc. No? Those are the people who, who appreciate it most, but many, many of my friends speak of the foreign community as I don't know, when a big house is built next to them, they say, of course, it's a gringo. It's a rich gringo. And they don't really understand the type of people we have in the foreign community. There are several groups in San Miguel. There's the foreign community. That, and within the foreign community, there are several groups also. No? Yes. Then, in those that have come from Mexico City, Monterrey, wherever, most of them are not interested in the people of San Miguel. They have their own groups, and they get together. And most of them are young married couples, or single women, 
young women that have come to live here. It's, it's San Miguel is a very interesting, wonderful place. Somebody said the other day, somebody that had just moved here, but it's a Mexican couple, she said she could feel God in San Miguel. Isn't that beautiful? beautiful. No? And I can feel beautiful vibes in this town, and I would never want to live anywhere else. One of my favorite places is going to the Hardeen and watching the children and watching the balloons and the candy and the older couples who are trying to get the sun mm -hmm. when it's winter. No? Okay. I love the Hardeen. I think San Miguel is a, a magical place. There was a wonderful painter that lived here. His name was Emilio Bass, and his partner was Sandy Fisher. Sandy was from someplace in Texas, and they gave us a monkey as a wedding present. They asked us what we preferred, a silver uh, ice bucket or a monkey. So we chose the monkey. And we had the monkey, when I had no children, the monkey was usually loose in the house. But then when I had my first child, I had to tie him up because he'd get in the crib with the baby and take away the bottle. Uh, they're very curious animals, you know. And after that, we had, oh, let me tell you that one. We had a little monkey, it was a, sar a sarawato, are those big black monkeys. They're howler monkeys, the howler monkey. And we obtained, somebody gave us a little howler. He was about so high. And he usually went around on my shoulder. You cannot house train a monkey. And my son, Fidel, from, who lives in Querétaro, came to introduce his girlfriend and his mother, her mother. And when they came, in upstairs, I had Wamba on my shoulder, and at that moment, Wamba decided to go to the bathroom, and he had eaten um, betabel beets. He had eaten beets. <clears throat> this is how I was introduced to, to this family. And then I had, I don't know if you know Christopher, Cristobal Maquis, uh, Cristobal is a veterinarian, and yeah, and Cristobal brought in a monkey that I, for me to keep for him. It was a, a spider monkey, and we had him tied up here to the main gate, and the children from the schools would come to see him when they got out of school, and he would steal their candy or their pencil or pen or whatever, and they, you know you can't. They're very, they're, they can be very vicious. I have a bite here on my leg from, from that monkey. And he would get on our shoulders and we couldn't get him down. There was nothing. He loved things that we had in the, in the restaurant, in El Correo, and we would put it, and with the tail, he would get it close to him and we couldn't get him off. But my husband would come down and he would take him off, okay? And we finally had to get rid of him. I had small grandchildren, and uh, he is in Jalapa, Veracruz. He's in Jalapa. When I first came here, there were, I guess, four doctors. One was Cello's father from the pharmacy, and there was a military doctor here, and Dr. Olcina, who was a Spanish doctor, and my husband. The hospital was down in San Juan de Dios. Uh, there's a big school. You know where San Juan de Dios is? There's a church and there's a school. That school was the first hospital of San Miguel. It had been a convent and was turned into a hospital. It was an enormous place. And in 1957, 
the new hospital on Reloj Street was inaugurated with all the newest things. It was beautiful and the money was, it was a federal hospital, but the money was obtained through people here in San Miguel, Mexicans. And uh, that was our hospital until they moved up to where it is now. Yeah, yeah. And I had two of my children, three of my children here at the hospital. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Those were, I uh, things have changed so much, but for the good also. You know? uh, we, we loved our small San Miguel. Then it began to grow. And uh, when first Gigante opened, a lot of people didn't like that, but it was wonderful because you didn't have to go to Celaya to do your shopping, no? And it has grown with so many services. I think San Miguel is still wonderful. My father was British. And uh, my mother was from Hot Springs, Arkansas. And my father came from England to work in a British American lumber camp near between Mexico City and Toluca, where all the mountains are. And my Arkansas grandfather came to work at the same lumber camp. My mother came down to visit and married my father. We later, when I was about two, we moved to Irapuato, which is near here. There was a British American cigarette company in Irapuato. And my father moved there as a manager. And when I was about 10 or 11, my parents were divorced and my mother and I moved to Mexico City. And um, pretty soon my stepfather, arrived on the scene. We knew him from Irapuato because he had been gov the governor, state governor here. And they were married and came, we came to live here. He was from the state of Guanajuato, so this is where he chose to, to build the school with Felipe Cosío del Pomar, the Peruvian with whom they began the school. Yes. San Miguel is now very popular. It's a wedding site. We suffer the weddings every weekend, but it's wonderful for the economy, no? We have a great influx of retired people who live here. I wonder if it will always be popular. Because before I came to San Miguel in the 40s, San Miguel was a very popular place with artists from Mexico City. And after that, there was nothing for a bit. And then when the Instituto, I'm sorry, but the Instituto started the growth of San Miguel. And you can still find people who have businesses here. Lucha Maxwell, for instance, Robert, Robert Maxwell came as a student of the Instituto. And when he was here, he acquired polio and went to the ABC hospital in Mexico City where Lucha was a nurse. And then they came back to live here and started their businesses. Sylvia Samuelson came as a student, married Fred, who was a teacher, and opened, and then there's so many other businesses like that that began with the Instituto Allende. I, I don't like to boast, but yes, the Instituto is responsible for many, many of the good things, maybe some of the bad things too, eh? I used to hear stories <clears throat> in the Campanella School, where Bellas Artes is now, when the GI Bill of Rights, after the Second World War, this was a crazy town because so many, I could name a few, but I won't, oh, of, the, of those that came with the GI Bill of Rights and stayed here. 
and they used to bathe in, in the fountains of the Hardeen and do all kinds of crazy things. It must have been a lovely time in Sutton Hill. Nothing remains static. And if it remains static, it dies. No, there have to be changes. The Rosewood Hotel, I still, I still have a feeling about that because that was part of the Instituto grounds. No, and uh, the, in the summer and in the winter with the winter birds, we would have 50, 60, 80, 100 people in line to register, both in the summer and in the winter months. And the school was full, and it was full of life. On the 4th of July, there was always a, a 4th of July dance at the Instituto, and it was, um, it was a disguise dance, yeah. And Sterling always won first place because he made incredible things. And uh, then things began to change. People, artists wanted, or students, wanted more modern things. And the Instituto was a little bit behind in that. So when my mother died, the Instituto was divided in two. Jaime has the part where uh, the weddings take place, where the, the fairs take place and so forth, and ha he has a lot of, a lot of it is rented out. Yeah. Rudy has the school part, it's working well too. Not what it was, it's different, but it's still good, yeah. When I read the newspaper, I read the Atención, for instance, and I'll see the history of something. Hmm. I say, that's not the way it was. Us older people, they're going to have to shoot us to get rid of us because we know the truth. No? 